you know, in real time, because one's sort of impatient for things to eventuate, uh, one thinks, well, you know, why haven't why hasn't this unraveled uh, more quickly? And um, I think the answer is when one looks back, you say, A, these things often take a long time to come out, and B, uh, super bubbles tend to be marked by great rallies. And this is definitely, you know, a super bubble, as far as I can see. And we've definitely had, you know, first-class rally. Um, the question then is whether that first-class rally sticks. And um, I suppose my my hunch is that it it it, it won't stick and that we that it, it will just you know turn out to be a so to speak a dead cat balance but we'll see on today's episode of the what the finance podcast i have the pleasure of welcoming on edward chancellor who's a financial historian journalist and investment strategist and also also the author of the recently released book the price of time uh which i'd really recommend so edward thanks for coming on the podcast today thanks for having me no problem. And I'm looking forward to our conversations. I guess we can start at maybe quite simple or potentially not simple. Uh, what is the price of time? So the price of time is the name I give, what's well, the name I gave my book, as you say, but um, the book is a, is a history and analysis of interest, concept of interest, what interest is, why does it exist? When did it originate? And there are, multiple definitions of interest but the one um the one that i think is often used but is technically inaccurate is people refer to to interest being the price of money and that is only half a definition because say for instance you wanted to borrow some money from me and I demanded it back, you know, that you repaid me simultaneously without any time interval, uh, there would be no interest charged on it. So what is interest? The interest is the difference between the, the price of money of, of, of a, a, certain, um, a certain value of money today and a certain value of money over a period of time. And it's really historically been this failure to take on board the concept of time that has um, led to people um, misunderstanding interest. Mm -hmm. So the, the, my point is that interest is incorporates the price of time or what in finance or investment we call the time value of money and you know there are a number of reasons why we place a value on time but one of them perhaps the sort of basic one originates in in human psychology that we prefer present over future pleasures, that we have uh, what economists call positive time preference. And why does mankind have a po positive time preference? Well, for a start, because we're mortal. We're, we're only on this earth for a short period of time. And therefore, um, we prefer, as the French 18th century economist, uh, Turgo put it, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. But we can elaborate on that theme further in the conversation if you want. Yeah, it's interesting uh, how you put it that way. And I guess you, you mentioned there why it's important sort of because people need to be, I guess, reimbursed for sacrificing that, uh, you know, consumption now for, for all that money now for the future um is, is that the main reason for it is also i guess a risk are there, are there other reasons that's important yes yeah, so, i mean as you know in my book um i you know i discuss the origins of 
of interest in, in the ancient Near East, in ancient Mesopotamia, some five millennia ago. And what one can see when one looks at the origins of interest, that interest is serving certain functions. First of all, um, we have, you know, I interest is an incentive to lend. <laughs> um, and so what we find in the etymologies, the ancient etymologies of the word interest, is that they are often linked to uh, words relating to livestock. So, for instance, in um, ancient uh, Mesopotamian, the word is mass or mash, and that uh, a mash mash is, is a, a kid goat or a lamb. And what we can surmise is that farmers, even in prehistoric periods, were lending out their livestock to another farmer, perhaps you know, some who a farmer who had some grazing land but not um, livestock and was receiving back some share in, in, in the product produce. And, and, and that we see that really right up until the 19th, to the 20th century in the United States, where livestock was being lent in, um, in, in the United States, um, in, in rural areas. Uh, and, and what was demanded back was say, for instance, you lent a cow for a year, you got the cow back with an extra calf and, any 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 further calves that the cow produced belong to the borrower. So so that's one aspect, uh, the agriculture aspect, and that's also linked. Uh, you you can also expand that to 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 lending of grain, uh, of, of of seed corn, and um, we find uh, in ancient Mesopotamia um, uh, loans of of barley at relatively high rates of interest, at thirty three and third percent. A year, in other words, one one third extra demanded. Um, but we also find other other things, um, other functions of interest in ancient Mesopotamia. First of all, you mentioned risk, and what we see is that uh, loans, uh, Babylonian loans for uh, sea voyages, for commercial sea voyages, carried a higher rate of interest. Than than um, for other loans, and that would take uh, that would incorporate the risk, a sort of insurance premium, in case the merchant ship uh, uh, sank at sea, and we we that was expe exta expended in ex extended into uh, the Middle Ages when there was a general ban on usury, uh, which is seen as which is defined as sort of. Uh, unfair or illegal exploitation with interest, but in the in the in the Middle Ages, what was allowed were these so-called bottomry loans, which were loans on the ship's bottom. And if the ship sank again, uh, you um, you would, the the lender wouldn't get their money back, uh, but they yielded a relatively high rate of interest. So, as you know, in my book, uh, I have a chapter. Uh, or on interest as um, an 18th century Italian philosopher, Ferdinand, Ferdinando Galliani called it the, that interest was the price of anxiety or, or what we would see the price of risk. And for instance, you, you know, uh, in, in recent years, you know, they developed um, derivatives on, on um, loans, on, on credit, called credit default swaps. And those credit default swaps were pure risk premia on, on, the, um, on the loan. So every, every loan contains both a, um, a, a time value and a risk premium. Yeah, it's interesting to, to hear the history about it. Um, and so if, if we look at, I guess, we're all very near-term biased. And you mentioned there that there's been derivatives, there's been sort of these new financialized uh, products that have been offering. And I guess if we look at the past decade, uh, you know, interest rates have been close to zero and sometimes negative in, in some regions. So from what you've seen, you know, has that ever happened before? And then what impact does such a, you know, low cost of time have on an economy, markets, all those things? Well, 
Um, the reason I wrote the book was that I, you know, over the, at the beginning of the last decade, I was working for uh, an investment firm in Boston called GMO. I was working the asset allocation team. And so we had a, we had to, you know, broad selection of different investments. And what one noticed or what I noticed was, first of all, obviously the short term rates were very low, but the long term rates seemed very low. Uh, historically, they were sort of, you know, in, in um, statistical terms, they were sort of two standard deviations below the mean in Japan. They were three standard deviations below the mean. Um, we saw a lot of risk taking. So this um, chasing for yield. Um, and that was reflected both in domestic uh, lending, say in the United States, for instance, there was a great boom in um private equity and leveraged buyout loans, which, um, and so, so great was the demand for leveraged buyout loans, known as leveraged loans, that the traditional covenants were taken away. And so that, that was interesting and, and concerning, that this reaching for yield. Um, one thing we haven't discussed so far, um, we haven't directly discussed so far, is the role of interest in, in valuation. So um, anyone who's done any investment or finance is, is aware uh, that we arrive at a present value through discounting, uh, applying a discount rate to future income. So all valuation is dependent on that discount rate. And in that discount rate lurks as the great American economist Irving Fisher puts, in that discount rate lurks the interest rate. And so um, if you take the interest rate down to very low levels, both by um, the central bank reducing the short-term rate, but also by the central bank acquiring securities with its own potentially infinite balance sheet, uh, which brings down both long-term rates and provides liquidity to the markets and reduces volatility in the markets, then that combination serves to push up asset prices. Um, as Warren Buffett commented a few years ago, that the interest rate is to valuation what gravity is to matter. And shortly after Buffett made this comment, we went into the final stages of what was called the everything bubble, in which all financial assets and all real assets were impacted by this combination of ultra low rates and central bank securities purchases. So this ranges from you know, equities to real estate, to fine art, to vintage cars, to, I don't know, but, you know, uh, baseball trading cards. And needless to say, cryptocurrencies, non-fungible tokens and the like, which are the most sort of speculative efflorescence of the everything bubble. And as, as, Mung, as Charlie Munger, Buffett's partner, commented in 2020 that this was the most extraordinary period in the history of finance. And I think that's a fair comment. And so take, for instance, you know, not, not all equities were inflated uh, around the world, uh, but the, the dominant market, the United States, uh, the valuations in the US market on the long-term, on, on the best, most robust, long-term measures of valuation of which you know the most commonly used one is the so-called cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio which just takes the average real earnings over the past decade and compares that to the current price um, and the what we found there was that by the end of 2021 the u.s stock market was at a higher valuation that had end, than at any time with the exception of the last few months of the dot-com bubble, which still retained its place, 
as the greatest and most extreme bubble uh, in valuation terms in US history. However, if you look across the board at wealth and the and the Federal Reserve creates uh, produces data for net household wealth, you can find you find that the net household wealth relative to GDP was at an all time high at the end of 2021. Um, so I think if you incorporate all assets, it's fair to say that the greatest bubble in history was the one that started to burst uh, after 2021. And that's not just the United States. Um, you see that in China with this, not so much in equities, but a massive real estate bubble, you see it in real estate bubbles you know, from New Zealand, Australia, up to Sweden, Britain, Canada, Switzerland, and the like. Um, so aggregate wealth, uh, you know, what I call virtual wealth, because it's not really related to any um, income generation or increase in income generation, or even related to savings, uh, was, was higher than ever before. Yeah, it makes sense. So if we, you know, you mentioned there that on, on a specifically valuation perspective, the higher the interest rates goes, goes uh, the the higher the uh, cash free rate, the higher that you have, to, the more you have to discount uh, sort of assets to, and then that would mean that the value in the future or the present value is going to be lower yeah. um, now than in the future. And yeah. we, we saw that last year. So the, the, you know, the central banks didn't really start tightening after this unprecedented period of negative rates or, or zero rates in, in the US and UK, but negative in Europe and Japan. Um, the central banks didn't really start tightening until you know, the second quarter of last year. And obviously tightening from lowest levels in history. And immediately we saw um, you know, the global bond markets and uh, equity markets sell off. And um, so I think at the end of last year, the Financial Times calculated that some $30 trillion of global valuations have been wiped out. Now, you know, some of that's come back in the last in the last nine months, and we can discuss that later, but that would have already, uh, that that loss last year would have already accounted for a, you know, one of the greatest wealth losses in history compared to say, you know, the global financial crisis and, and the dot-com bust. Um, but, and then we saw, you know, some markets, you know, had very sharp declines, the most speculative ones, the cryptocurrencies, the, the SPACs, the special purpose acquisition companies that had proliferated in, in 2020-21, you know, which were you know, merging into you know, electric vehicles, um, space flights, you know, that sort of stuff, um, highly speculative. Uh, they, they, all, you know, they all came down in you know, 1995, 1995%. Then long-term bonds, um, also suffered massive losses. The the for instance, you know, the most notable losses to my as far as I know in the bond markets were the uh, long dated UK inflation indexed uh, gilts or bonds, which were trading at negative real yields at the beginning of last year. And we I'd known about these for a while because when I was at GMO, we we had been shorting these bonds as they were, you know, at close to zero yield over 50 years, thinking that, you know, how could the interest rate be so low for so long? And then <laughs> we lost huge amounts of money because they <laughs> carried on going, going down and down and down. Um, but then at the end of last year, um, they wouldn't necessarily at the beginning of last year, they started to lose money. And by September... Uh, some of these long dated gilts had lost 85% of their value. So, you know, the term gilt refers to a gilt edge security. Uh, and that the idea is it, it's, it's as safe as it comes. Yeah. 
So imagine a a gilt edge security um, losing 85% of its value at a time when the short term rate set by the Bank of England has gone from close to zero to just 3%. And that 3% is less, is rough, is roughly half. I think it was just below 3% times. So it was, I think it was, if I'm, if I'm right, it was around two and a half or 2.75%. So when the the policy rate was less than half its post-war average, which is 6%, that, that very low, below average rate was enough to crash supposedly one of the safest financial securities on offer. That That's very significant. And it was not least significant because um, the UK pension funds that um, had, um, you know, that had these uh, defined benefit pension plans whose, and it's a bit complicated, but the, if you if you provide a, a defined benefit pension plan uh, to 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 um, beneficiaries, it means that when the short term interest rate uh, falls, for accounting reasons, the it's estimated that your liabilities, your pension liabilities have increased. And so the pension funds chose to hedge this risk by leveraging up these negative yielding uh, long UK linkers and, and then were threatened with um, insolvency uh, at um, at the time, you know, when, when interest rates started to rise and the Bank of England had to step in. So that was another sort of, it's not exactly anticipated in my book, but I, as you as you know, I point out the problems of both yield chasing and of the pension that the pensions suffered from in this low rate era. And uh, you know, nothing we haven't talked about, but one of the you know definitions or functions of interest is an incentive to to save um, and at very low interest rates. Uh, there are two problems. One is you have a disincentive to save. Why should I put any money away if it's only going to uh, you know, yield uh, a, a couple of you know a, a couple of hundred basis points? And that base, those basis points are all risk, not <laughs> not not um, risk free return. And and so that that's one problem. The other is, is simply that um, when bonds are long term bonds are trading at very low yields and equities are very high valuations your returns from investment over the long time, not, not necessarily over a short period, because you can have bubbles that give you artificially high returns, but over you know, uh, the long run or medium term, 10, 20 years, you are going to get low returns. So you have less incentive to save, you get low returns on your investment, and you have the pension funds threatened uh, uh, with, with rising uh, liabilities when interest rates are low uh, engaged in risky activities. So none of that is is really good for um, the financial system, and nor is it good for society as a whole. No, definitely not. So have, have you been surprised? You've mentioned there an example of an asset that's performed very, very poorly, I guess, or at least during that period with higher interest rates and higher inflation. But have you been surprised maybe how certain markets have, have reacted around the world globally? If we go to the US, you know, as you said, there's been quite a large rally over the past six six months or so it's this year. Um, have you been surprised about that, even though uh, central banks continue to tighten? Um, well, you know, markets never go down in a straight line. And bear markets by their nature are unpredictable, just as just as bull markets are unpredictable. And um, yeah, after the 1929, October 29 crash, market rebounded, uh, recovering 80% of its losses before subsequently collapsing. And you know, the, the great Japan um, bubble economy of real estate and stocks. Also, you know, the bear market took. Well, I mean, not sure, quite sure when it ended, but it certainly 
had these staggering bounces, what, what they were called the, the dead cat bounces in retrospect. Um, I'm, I'm thinking what's happening at the moment, that the, the, my thesis on interest is that it's an, uh, to quote again Irving Fisher, it's an omnipresent phenomenon. Um, as, as another, as a contemporary Amer Harvard economist, Jeremy Stein says, interest gets into all the cracks. And some problems emerge very rapidly, you know, obviously such as, you know, these UK linkers collapsing, but others take longer to come to the fore. And I'm thinking in, in particular, real estate. Um, I mean, people tend to forget that, you know, that the US, that the, the, the credit bust of 2007, 2008, actually started with the peak with the beginning of the decline in US real estate in 2005 and you know by 2006 uh losses were appearing on these rather obscure subprime securities that people didn't uh really understand so and I was in New York at the time writing financial journalism and actually because I had quite good contacts I was sort of aware of of this slow motion train wreck uh, and it took you know it took a very long time for that to come through the system in in, in you know so in, in in 2000 some early 2007 there were some losses on subprime loans by an HSBC US subsidiary called Household Financial and then in the summer, these a couple of Bear Stearns hedge funds um, blew up that were speculating in or leveraging um, mortgage, uh, subprime mortgage-backed securities. And we had problems in the European money markets and, and freezing of money market funds in Europe. Now, the reason I mention all this is that the US stock market went to a new high, I think in October 07. So you can see that people didn't, you know, pe people who weren't following the story uh, were blithe to these problems, even though they were quite significant and were making the front page of the financial media. Um, so, you know, in real time, because one's sort of impatient for things to eventuate, uh, one thinks, well, you know, why haven't why hasn't this unraveled uh, more quickly? And um, I think the answer is, when one looks back, you say, a, these things often take a long time to come out, and b, uh, super bubbles tend to be marked by great rallies and this is definitely you know a super bubble as far as I can see and we've definitely had you know first class rally um, the question then is whether that first class rally sticks and um, I suppose my my hunch is that it it it, it won't stick and that we that it, it will just you know turn out to be a so to speak a dead cat bounce but we'll see yeah, it's a really interesting way, way to look at it. So, you know, you mentioned there how interest interest rates or higher rates of interest permeate throughout the economy. And, um, you know, it looks like potentially that could interest rates could remain higher for, for longer. Um, there's a really interesting sort of chart that you have in your book. Uh, I think it was looking at sort of the trends of interest rates in past uh, sort of millenniums for past empires. And I think you mentioned this in uh, your recent interview on forward guidance with uh Jack Farley and, and Joseph Wang, which I'd really recommend people watching. Uh, and I found it really interesting. So I guess you look at the Babylonian empire and it sort of interest rates and the cost of money really decreases, it sort of plateaus and then it drastically increases the same for the Roman empire. So if we look at, I guess, the trends of what we've seen in, in the US and the Western world, it's sort of gone, been going down quite a lot. It's plateaued uh, at zero or even lower. And then we're seeing this little increase. Do you see sort of a similar trend of interest rates going to go high and they're not going to come back or what are your thoughts from there 
Well, I mean, first of all, I'd presage any comment by saying that forecasting <laughs> the direction of interest rates is is very difficult. I mean, it's actually one of the reasons I got into the whole subject of interest, which you know I'd been writing and practicing finance for 25 years before I actually started thinking seriously about it. But one of the reasons I started thinking seriously is because we had these you know, bond forecasting models in our asset allocation team that were producing you know, consistently wrong answers. And what, I, what, what we found when we looked at it is that bond, uh, bond yields are not reliably mean reverting. And if they're not reliably mean reverting, they're not, it's not possible to predict them accurately. And so that that's what you I mean, it is very interesting that in the investment world you find um you find you know these people who you know called value investors who buy stocks when they're cheap. And the underlying idea there is that they will mean revert to their normal valuation. And likewise, a growth stock, which is very expensive, you know, on price to earnings or price to book, will mean revert back to lower. That that's sort of that's what what motivates equity investors in valuation terms and style. But you don't find that at all in the bond world because it's very difficult to predict where bond yields are moving. Having said that, we do know historically um, some things. First of all, that, um, that cycles in bond markets tend to last for decades. So whereas equities, equity market cycles, bull markets, bear markets might last, you know, 10 years on average or you know, 20 years at a pinch, the bond bond cycles tend to last, well, you know, really between roughly 30 years and 60 years. And you know, we've just come out of a 40-year bond bull market with yield sinking ever learn. Now, we obviously didn't know how long that, that bond bull, bull market would last. And can't, you know, anyone who commented on on bond on the bond markets were, you know, you know, very well known people like Bill Gross, who used to run PIMCO, and my friend Jim Grant, financial historian journalist who has a publication called Grant's Interest Rate Observer. And occasionally they would sort of venture, you know, the bond market, uh, you know, has reached a trough and now yields going to rise. But you look back and they were making these comments in, I don't know, 2002, 2003, 2011, 12, you know, thereabouts. Um, so, or, you know, even the best commentators um, find it difficult to predict. However, I think we can say um, with a fair degree of confidence that we've reached we, a turning point in the, um, in the, in the, bond cycle and therefore if we knew nothing else we could expect bond yields to rise not consistently but to be on a rising trend for the next you know three decades I mean, it wouldn't be wouldn't be surprised that would be entirely conventional outcome we may have a different outcome but that should be almost your base case but the the point you're making or raising is an observation that I took from the great history of interest rates by Sidney Homer, the, the bond guru of Salomon Brothers during its, during its glory days, and, um, and Richard Siller, his co-author, who updated this book after uh, Homer died. And the observation there and this is very interesting, which is that interest rates over the course of the civilization follow this U shape, starting high, coming down for a long period, then having a, a, a long flattish period, and then rising very sharply. So you can see this pronounced U, and you see it in in Babylon, in 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 ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and you also actually see it in uh, in the Dutch Republic. So Holland in the seventeen, in the, really in the 
16th, 17th and early 18th century was you know, the most advanced financial economy with the lowest interest rates. And then you know, when the Dutch Republic succumbed to French invasion during the, you know, the revolutionary period, uh, interest rates rose. And um, so you, you could say that you know, Western civilization, you look at it and you say there are so many signs of sort of extreme decadence, of which of which the in the very low interest rates uh may be a symptom of that decadence. Now, if you subscribe to the view that Western civilization was decadent a bit long in the tooth, <laughs> then any collapse <laughs> in Western civilization would probably almost I almost can say inevitably be accompanied by rising rates. And um so that's that's something to to think about. I mean you don't necessarily want to bet on it because you know the difference between short term movements, you know, the, and long term movements and uh, is um you know it is it, is you know, you, you you know, it's difficult to, to, to navigate. But as a speculation, I think it, it's it's quite interesting. If you want to be a bit narrower and less sort of apocalyptic, you could say, um, you could make this observation that um, that periods of these bond cycles have tended to follow movements in globalization. So uh, when globalization is expanding and you're bringing more of the workforce of the global workforce so to speak into the global market and accompanied perhaps by large-scale immigration you are serving to dampen wage growth and you're also serving to dampen inflationary pressures and that weak wage growth and weak inflation pressures uh, feeds through I think, into low rates. So you could just say, forget about the end of civilization. It's, it, well, it's going to happen one day, but you don't want to really bet your life on it. But you could say, well, we're coming to a turning point in globalization. The, you know, the Chinese have contributed to the low interest rates uh, in recent years twofold. One by, you know, exporting. Uh, a whole load of stuff to the West and and falling traded goods prices, and also by the Chinese, um, up until a few years back, being the the, the marginal source of demand for U.S. Uh, bonds, Treasury securities, and agency bonds. Um, so, I I if the world um, bifurcates, uh, if globalization does come to an end. And that that again, you can you know, before you know, that's a slow process unless accelerated by open war, in which case it becomes a lot faster. But it you know, leaving aside no war, then you you could say um, that reversal of globalization, everything else being equal, will push up rates. And then there's another point made by um, the the retired the old the retired the the British former. Bank of England economist Charles Goodhart, um, who, who wrote a book called The Great Reversal with a colleague called, I think he's called Manoj Pradhan. And their argument is that uh, China's population is aging. And that means there are going to be fewer people joining the global workforce. And there, they also argue that aging populations are less, you know, ha have have less, in effect, surplus capital, and and that pushes up interest rates. Now that goes against a lot of the arguments one was hearing up until recently that you know aging populations brought down interest rates. Uh, but there's something um, I think reasonably compelling in their argument. And you know, if, again, if I if I had to bet, this is uncertain, but if I had to bet, um, you know, whether China's aging population would push up rates. I would say, yeah, yes, it will. But it's the you know a lot of these things are not. There are good arguments on both sides. 
Yeah, definitely. It's great, um, crazy to think, you know, as he's saying there, it's probably wouldn't be better your house than that, but it does seem that at least this next cycle is going to, interest rates are going to be going up over the next 40 years or so. So, uh, yeah. I may, I made one other observation, which is, <laughs> again, from the, from the Sydney Homer book, which is that, and this is a very important point and wise point, which is that Homer says that people think that the interest rates that they experience today are normal and then they are constantly surprised by the interest rates that eventuate. So you're back in you know, the turn of the century when you know, US bond yields were, you know, treasury yields were up, you know, around six and a half percent, as far as I can remember, and you got four and a half percent uh real yield on your treasury inflation protected securities. That seemed normal. And then you know, fast forward 20 years, and we had, you know, 18 trillion dollars worth of bonds trading at negative yields. And many people think that was normal. And then of course they were all surprised by the rates rising last year and the devastation that the rise in rates would cause. And I mean, for instance, you, you know, earlier this year, um, US had a regional banking crisis with um, Silicon Valley Bank uh, blowing up, uh, having it, because the the, the um, Silicon Valley Bank hadn't done anything, you know, as far as we know, particularly speculative in Silicon Valley, <laughs> But what they'd done is they had um, they had an asset liability mismatch, and they'd they'd taken their deposits and and put them in in um, U.S. Treasuries, supposedly risk free, and then lost, I think, more than their total equity uh, in unrealized losses as bond yields rise. So there, there's and so obviously <laughs> they were not expecting rates to rise because a small rise in rates was enough to wipe them out. Yeah, it's a great point. So thank you so much for your time, Edward. I really appreciate it. Um, my, my last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? Well, I think the message takeaway is that if you want to understand investment and finance, uh, you have to start thinking a bit more deeply about the nature and role of interest. And that also holds for economics too. I think if you don't, the, I think interest lies at the kernel of both finance and economics. So if you don't understand what interest is and what it does, then you will neither be a good investor, nor will you be a half good economist. But, you know, it seems to me a reason I wrote this book is that Far too many people didn't understand. And I think that the investment world is much more apprised to it um, and they are much more aware of these issues than the than the central bankers and academics who really pay little attention. Yeah, it's a great message. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll put the link down to the book if anyone wants to purchase it. Is there anywhere else people could find uh, what you do online? Yeah, I've got a website, edwardchancellor.com and... Um, yeah, you can look at that. Perfect. I'll put that in the description, but thanks again for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.